recording the meeting right now. Give me one moment and I'll share my screen and we'll get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Can everyone share, see my screen? Yep. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for joining for uh, a general meeting here from Hyperledger Healthcare SIG. My name is Mike McCoy, I'm the chair of the uh, special interest group. Uh, today, before we get started, we want to start every meeting with the antitrust policy that the Linux Foundation gives out. Pretty much discloses that if you have any compromising information within your company, projects, or teams, please not disclose it out here as this is an open forum and uh, you wouldn't want to have any of your detailed uh, business relations or projects be uh, released out. So uh, thank you very much and uh, we will get started. So uh, we'll do some introductions for those that are new into the group. Uh, I'm aware of Leah, John, Jonathan, and Daniel who are prior participants in the group, but Alberto, I don't know if, if we've heard from you yet, so so please uh, give an introduction for the group and, and, and who you are, where you're based, uh, what brings you to the, the special interest group, and what you're most interested in learning. Alberto, you are muted, I believe, but the floor is yours. Alberto, can you hear us? All right, no, no more Alberto. I guess he's with us in spirit in some way. So, um, and, and Dan, where, where are you based these days, actually? I'm in Chicago. Chicago, awesome. If you want to give a quick introduction for those that may not be aware of you as well. Okay. Um, yeah, my name's Dan Watkins. I've been in software development for a little over 30 years, actually. Um, I had an internet startup uh, in 1995 that was focused on e-commerce. After, after 2010, I pivoted to health tech and doing some consulting there. I'm currently, my day job is currently at a company called NowPow in Chicago, and we do blockchain and machine learning for health tech, and we're focused on um, social determinants of health. I'm currently working with Leah on her startup, Quafacta, and we're doing, we're doing a lot of blockchain stuff with mobile and machine learning as well. It's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. All right. So we'll go into uh, community amount, community announcements. Are there any announcements that anyone in the group uh, would like to discuss with the group from uh, things that are either within the Hyperledger community or outside of it? Good morning. This is Indira. Hey, Dear, welcome to the conversation. Uh, you, we're just getting underway. Um, so far in our agenda, we're going over community announcements uh, for either events, uh, happenings, things have happened in the healthcare blockchain space within the last uh, two weeks or so. Um, so if you have any news or events that, that you know, really piqued your interest, uh, please uh, release them and share them here. Yes, I think um, last week there was, um, as part of the United Nations General Assembly, um, 75th General Assembly, there were a lot of satellite events and one of them was focused on science digest and um, global health. There was a um, lot of a good representation. Um, there were a couple of noteworthy events also organized um, by uh, Consensus Health from the health um, utility grid as well as there were a lot of panel discussion around that. And there was a panel discussion also on um, global health and technology that I was a part of along with the former CIO of Human and Health Services. And that was a good event last week. I think there's also an upcoming event, uh, a conference this week on IEEE um, uh, blockchain for healthcare focus. For sure, yeah, the, the United Nations General Assembly was a, a big event uh, that you know, brought together a lot of people in the industry and, and there was a 
a huge focus. Sorry, my dog has a chew toy and it's, it's making the background noise very interesting. But I, what I also thought was interesting last week was um, was Meta Ledger's integration into uh, the HIBCC uh, announcement within the, I think it's health industry number system data. Was anyone uh, aware of that or, or also saw that news too? Yeah, I read the headlines, didn't dive into it, it's still in my inbox. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So the, I think the HIBCC stands for, give me one second, Health Industry Business Communications Council, and they integrated this health industry number system within the Med Meta Ledger project. Meta Ledger in, in, in general is, uh, they create a, a kind of like a, a federated model for chargebacks and, uh, and contracts so that uh, you could be able to help uh, with payment and claims adjudication within a network. And what they've been able to do is uh, be able to create a platform for many different solutions and be able to have a number system and, and a standards body to be able to help with that, I think is, is kind of a game changer in, in as far as standards and regulation is concerned within the platform. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how Chronicle will, um, will help build that within that network. It's, it's to me, like Chronicle has a task of, of getting a lot of adoption into the network and uh, the governance and the frameworks within the within building out that network are going to be so globally cement and have a lot of semantics that are attributed to that, that will need to connect into each other. It'll be very interesting to see how they can all interoperate and work together for sure. Any other thoughts within that? I'll send the, the link to that actually. I'll send the, the link to that occurrence in the chat for anyone to take a look at. Cool. Um, that was just something I thought that, that came uh, to fruition. Kelly, oh, quiet. my dog is barking. <laughs> Apologize. So um, we don't have any of the subgroup uh, lead members uh, here today within Denise or Ravish or Steven. But uh, they unfortunately had Zoom issues as well, trying to get into their meetings and groups. So I apologize for anyone that wanted to join into that. Uh, Stevens is gonna happen, not this Monday, but the following Monday. And I think later today is the payer subgroup meeting, which is in three hours from now uh, that Ravish is going to be leading as well. So if you want to get a more uh, detailed update, you can meet with those subgroups earlier today or later today. We also have, um, there's a different, there's a wiki redesign team and, and uh, another team that's actually uh, helping to improve the Zoom efforts and the site efforts. And uh, if anyone wants to learn more about how you can help out the Hyperledger um, community teams and, and, and helping with these templates, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, we also want to go over the use case development team. Erica is not with us today. She unfortunately has a work meeting at this moment, but she wanted to know if anyone else is looking to take lead or take uh, more ownership within the use case development team uh, to reach out to her or me separately as you have my email and her email listed in the group uh, to be able to, to get that ball rolling. Is there any interest actually from this group right here of wanting to help with the healthcare use case development team. Can you just uh, tell us a bit more about it, Mike? Because I, I might be yeah. interested. Yeah, so I think actually you'd be perfect for it. So what they're trying to do is uh, create frameworks and templates for uh, startups, enterprises, federal entities that want to use blockchain in healthcare or life science. Uh, and, and they'll kind of create uh, framework and decision trees and uh, business plan outlines of how you could be successful in these type of projects. And then uh, I guess later down the road, it may refer you into particular platforms, their transaction speeds, their storage bandwidth, uh, their, their different features that are of, of relevance for each implementation and per use case. Uh, so those are more the gist of it. It's more 
I would think of it as uh, analysis, business analysis, technical analysis, as well mm. as a strategy analysis too. And it could be useful for those that are trying to work and ideate more on, on how they're going to build solutions, as well as uh, to, to, to drive in potential um, more customers or, or community members into what you're doing. Okay, um, I'll have a think about it only because of time, <laughs> um, the time, the big T factor, um, just in terms of how many hours you think um, need to be contributed to that as well. So, yeah, but I can maybe have an offline discussion with you or the team about that. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, just send me, um, send me a reminder email so I can just ping Erica on that and then go um, mm -hmm. from there. Okay, no problem. Like I, I may have some interest in being involved, so I'll, I'll, I'll email you after the uh, the meeting as well. Please do, absolutely. Yeah, I think that that group will be very. Um, it'll be a great way to guide in those who believe this type of technology can be of, of relevance and value later on the road, for sure. All right, uh, we've had these links for COVID nineteen virus pandemic support. Uh, there's grant opportunities that are, are still being had, though I believe NIH funding opportunity it, uh, has closed um, within the U.S. Um, these are still additional COVID-19 funding opportunities that you can be able to take advantage of. They're on the general meeting page for you to look at. Now, I want to make this, um, open, uh, this uh, meeting uh, open, but I do want to make an announcement that from the feedback we got from the survey we sent out, I sent out about three, four weeks ago, instead of having this meeting uh, occurring on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern time, there was more of a want and a need to have these meetings during the week because people are on vacation, holiday, they take off on Fridays. Uh, so Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time is going to be the new, uh, the new Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group general meetings, uh, which will be occurring in two weeks from now, which is on October 14th, uh, or sorry. Yeah, is this once every two weeks? It's once every two weeks, correct. So there will be a, um, or sorry, not this meeting, but in two weeks time, we will be changing it. So the 14th will be the last Friday meeting we have um, for the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. Starting on the, after the 14th session, uh, we will be moving them to Wednesdays. So then after the 14th, we'll be having a session on uh, Wednesday, or sorry, the next session will be on Wednesday, October 14th. This, this one is the last Friday session. Today is the last Friday session for the Healthcare Special Interest Group. We'll be moving it to Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Will the, will the calendar be updated where we go yes. download that? Okay. There'll be a calendar update starting on Monday for everyone to uh, be aware of. And I'm going to send out another email to, to notify the group as well. So I apologize for that. Are there any questions or any uh, comments, concerns on the date or time? We got, we had about 13 to 14 people give us that survey. And of the 14 people, eight of them requested it to be on either uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. And Wednesday in particular was voted on seven out of the 14 times. Awesome, cool, we'll move on. Now I wanted to have an open dialogue for anyone to uh, discuss things we could do better and uh, potential, I also wanted to, to note in here, potential projects that we, um, we'd like to see or present. I have a wish list of my own that, uh, that I wanted to be able to, um, to kind of write down. And I, I figured we could write that down here in uh, new business or open discussions, whether it's presenters, whether it's specific projects or things we wanted to work on. So give me one moment while I log in and uh, I'll, I'll be able to edit on this sheet.
All right, give me one moment, I'll share it back. All right, can everyone see the screen? Cool, and please don't be shy. I know it's like kind of early for uh, East Coasters, middle of the day for whatever, and it's a Friday, but uh, any participation, any ideas are, are highly appreciated. So um, what are some things you would like to see from the general, uh, the general special interest groups? What are either speakers or projects or, or problems would you like to kind of tackle and go over? Mark, I can start. Um, so it'd be great to see some use cases. Um, so all the, I mean, there's many different cases as we've seen um, now being adopted in healthcare, like biotech, for example, um, good manufacturing practice, um, the use of blockchain in those and clinical trials. If there are companies that are in, in the um, US or globally, use uh, already applying these use cases, that would be really interesting for, for us to see. I think Dan and I would be interested in that. Um, and also some of the, I guess, the, the problems or pain points they've, they've experienced as well. So um, be it from a governance level or just technology level as well. Okay. Do we have, um, do we have, maybe it's probably um, overlaps with what she said. Do we have a directory of the, all the hyperledger based um, solutions in healthcare? Yeah, so within Wiki um, Healthcare SIG, if you go to just the main site, uh, there is a re research resources uh, uh, section where you go to blockchain article citations and find white paper research that kind of uh, covered a lot of that. There's the general uh, SIG facts, frequently asked questions of how you be a member, what blockchain technology do you cover, all those type of things as well as uh, there's resources when, within each of the groups to within their page. Um, in the general meetings page, there's some folk here too. Um, but yeah, those are, those are really the links to go and find that. As well as you can find other recordings from other sessions that have been uh, posted here as well. And we have annual, annual reports uh, that have been given on the progress of the group and overall health and, and what we've been able to accomplish. So, um, but yeah. I think, um, sorry. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Indira. <laughs> no, I was just uh, thinking as he was just narrating, it'll be good to um, kind of focus on um, use cases targeted to specific healthcare industry. For instance, if we can invite um, companies who have used healthcare, maybe we want to know specifically how they have addressed the privacy security aspect of healthcare um, industry in their solutions and how did they implement it? I know it kind of varies from business to business, but it'll be interesting to hear different business or requirement from perspective what were the, some of the challenges from privacy security perspective, how they managed it um, in their blockchain implementation? All right, let me focus on that. Um, I, I, even that more concretely. One example. That is just one example. Could even be, you know, interoperability or did they have any kind of um, self-sovereign identity aspect? Um, are they, are they, you know, prototyping or do they have anything in production, digital identity, a lot of people are using sovereign network with Indy, a hyperledger Indy, have they used anything in the healthcare space? So to kind of have this kind of a targeted um, use cases, have people come and present just those specific aspect, even if they don't want to kind of share the whole solution or anything, I think it'll help us to kind of get insights into how the industry, how, how companies are under, you know, implementing this or catering to the specific industry needs. I have particular ones I'm going to reach out to, which is the Metal Ledger Project, um, Pharma Ledger Project. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like, I, what I'm trying to see is a uh, more granular, um, like, who exactly are the companies and teams that you wanted to see that I can reach out to and, and need to get a presentation. I'm, I'm interested in those. Soon we will have 
soon we will have genome genomics.io give a presentation here um they are uh they use uh trusted execution environments within amd sevs to uh to help um genomic sequencing companies being able to share genomic information across multiple channels and they're they have experimented by using the ethereum blockchain with this but they're looking to use other types of technology especially with hyperledger as well and uh they're going to give a presentation here soon with our group um to discuss solutions like that uh i can also reach out to another company called block cube they do um yeah i think it's a hyperledger based solutions for they have implemented um they have solutions for blockchain for clinical trials um operations yeah i know rama him and i spoke last week actually so we can uh, we can get block cube to present for us as well um he does clinical trial applications that are uh, just logged and audited and, authentic, um, and not verified but they're logged and audited on dlt on hyperledger fabric via block cube so sure we can get him to come on and present there's also um, any other ideas um, I, I don't know okay so I have this um, so I'm doing work with the IMD business school at the moment they're actually um, doing my our startup so they're, they're researching our startup and following it one of the things they asked about was token economics and I think that this is, I don't know if it's that relevant to this conversation, but it's something that I'm quite interested in. So, um, and I think going forward, it would be something also around incentivization um, for health outcomes and so on as well. So healthy behaviors and also the other thing around uh, a sharing clinical data as well. So I think that's a really sort of progressing into the next stage of how we use um, tokens in this environment. Yeah, I think those incentive mechanisms are, are very um, interesting, right? Uh, it, it just depends on, on how we've, it also depends where you are in the world to construct those systems. Uh, obviously the rules and regulations in place for that. But um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's understanding the provenance and, and how and legitimizing that health information too, uh, without mm -hmm. having malicious actors involved in the process and having, I think not all times, but most times you need a physician to kind of be that or someone that's clinically uh, actionable to verify that data point or those outcomes um, instead of just trusting into the, the patient and the consumer. That's at least the problems that I find out for those things. But I, I've also gotten recently into exploring uh, incentives for creating models that are verified by blockchain that are not mm -hmm. verified, but that are logged on a DLT. Um, yeah. I think that's super interesting field that could be able to um, help for predictive circumstances and machine learning models and also uh, replicating our neurological um, thoughts and, and the way we process information and data uh, through deep learning type of models too. So, mm, okay, be great. Really interesting. Thanks. Anything else? Jonathan, I know you got something. You, you, you have some good ideas around this. Love to you to bring something up. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I'm often hesitant to really talk about like um, the the like who's using it, what are they using it for? It's because it seems so much like a technology looking for a problem to solve, and I'd rather actually focus on the problems that need solving. In particular, just like the, what are the pain points? Like I know personally, um, so I'm an advisor to the ABMS, American Board of Medical Specialties, in the database and information technology, and AI, et cetera. And I, and I think, um, and I've been pitching blockchain uh, for, geez, four years now to them and, and to solutions, mostly for the authenticity and the provenance of information sharing, because the ABMS is actually a sort of a uh, uh, board, uh, board that oversees the other boards. It's like a parent board of the uh, 19 or so daughter boards, like internal medicine, pediatric surgery. And uh, so they're not really, um, 
they're sh sort of chaperones of information. They're not the creators of, of information. And, uh, and in just pitching um, the, the, the problems in information uh, veracity and authenticity is that there's certainly applications, not just necessarily for blockchain or distributed ledger technology, but cryptography, just, just the plain like hashing of your database and uh, encrypting it. And how do you actually like um, uh, verify the authenticity of your data and how you share data across different um, uh, member boards. And in which case, you know, SHA um, algorithms and cryptography of, of verifying the, the, the key of the signer of that information is just like the first pass of getting information uh, more authentic and secure. And um, how do you update your databases in a way that's secure and shareable and you can audit it over time to make sure that, that the information hasn't changed. So that's not quite blockchain technologies yet, but it really is about using one is SHA algorithms, um, hash algorithms, and then two is cryptography to sign that the, the, the data and then uh, then be able to distribute that, the public key, so other members can authenticate using that public key. So just basically, this decentralized public key infrastructure, which is like the underpinnings of blockchain technology, the, the tools, and how do we actually like, uh, disseminate that? And the problems I see often is, well, what about key management? Like right now, it's, it's Bob down in the server room uh, who's managing those keys. Like the, the, the CEO, the, the president of the, the, the other boards, they don't do anything with keys. So I see that as being a big barrier to adoption of this. Um, in, in all the different applications of blockchain, but in particular healthcare. So how can we educate those um, uh, people on how do you manage your keys? And so I think, you know, um, uh, uh, so uh, key management, key rotation, uh, key recovery, uh, uh, and then also just how do you create a system of distributing those keys to verify the authenticity among um, semi-trusted partners. And I, I'm still struggling with this as far as this, this is a barrier to adoption. I 100% agree <laughs> in many different aspects as that's why a lot of prior blockchain networks have been exposed and have had their vulnerabilities. And you know, once you let someone into a blockchain network, they can really do um, many different things that can be unfortunately malicious. So. Be able to make yeah. sure and I think if it's not done well, then it actually also opens up a vulnerability to that <laughs> where you can imagine someone could interject, you know, medical licensing or board certification into the process, which is that, yeah, it's trusted because it's been cryptographically signed, but like that actually would be an avenue for vulnerability. How does, um, how does sovereign, sovereign network, how does it manage that? They say they've got some tools to do all of this in each of the nodes. For key recovery, or management, you know, I don't know. I know the key infrastructure that they use, but like keeping that private key private um, is still a challenge. I can remember, I used to work on the Evernim Sovereign architecture landscapes. They use another third party for that management of keys. I'm not sure exactly what the service was though. So. Yep. And um, another um, kind of item that I thought about, you know, Jose Arieta, he, he implemented blockchain in the human health services in the government public sector. So public health um, a few years ago, he was one of the first ones. I thought it'd be interesting to hear his perspective and what lessons he learned and uh, you know what were the nature of the problem and he talk about his use cases and what were the lessons learned the challenges faced and uh, you know how things have evolved from there i thought it would be good to have his um, because he was one of the early adopters um, it'll be good to know his experience and if you could just have him over he was on the panel last week i thought he brings a good uh, background yeah, I, I think instead of having those general, like, what were the lessons you learned, Jose? Because I think he does that often. Um, maybe it could be 
at current state how the federal government or HHS um, could build upon what what has been created, maybe, right? Yeah, probably he when he deployed it a few years ago, probably he did not have some of the things have evolved since then a little bit um, in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, you know technology options, and a little bit of maturity and more attention to privacy security since they were one of the early adopters. And maybe ask about you know what could have been done differently, or just to kind of um, you know instead of people trying to fit the solution to a problem and um, solution looking for a problem. I think in this case, um, well, his, uh, of his solution was pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward. It was just a vendor management system to uh, attribute data and information to payments. And they needed, <clears throat> they needed to be able to um, send and adjudicate and automate a lot of those functions. And that's what, um, that's what his platform really did within the different silos that were within HHS. And he connected them into a DLT that would then give trust and access. And um, yeah, I think like, the problem was pretty much there. How we went to find that problem is, is probably an age old question that, that was going on in the halls of HHS for years is how do we interoperate? How do we work better together? I mean, NIH and um, NS NFS, yeah, NSF and, and a bunch of other government bodies who uh, within the United States who want to be able to uh, send and, and interoperate research information with it, and who's receiving grants and who's, uh, you know, because a lot of times there'd be uh, grants being given to um, multiple people when it was only supposed to be given to one or was all the grants went to one single entity and it wasn't fair, it wasn't fair part of the process. Um, they're creating a DLT like that right now in industry to be able to authenticate that. And then the U.S. Treasury Department uh, is also getting down that road of of, uh, of being able to use DLT to authenticate payments in the federal government. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to have those type of individuals part of this process. Though. I suppose uh, one of the other challenges to adoption is that the data retention law re requirements of laws for either state or federal government is that you have to maintain that either database or in this case, you just distributed ledger. So you can imagine like, um, you know, what better vendor contract to have than one that is required to be maintained forever. <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I, governments and I, my discussions with government uh, agencies that they don't want to run their own um, because they're required under their laws to maintain it. And like, there's all these legacy databases in each state government of, uh, of uh, MySQL or the, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, Oracle databases that are still run because they're mandated to, and they have a maintenance contract that's required as part of that. Yeah, kind of Another, uh, hell, actually. <laughs> Sorry, dear, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll let you finish your thought. No, it's just, I, I know uh, government maintaining contracts, uh, though are lucrative and uh, sales teams love to sell them, they're absolute hell for the people in the delivery and the offering teams to actually do it. And, uh, and uh, I mean, obviously someone has to do the job of maintaining and operating, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting world. Yeah, I think IBM, IBM has also got this um, vendor qualification, supplier qualification, blockchain based supplier qualification. And, uh, you know, when you kind of look around the industry, people are targeting use cases and there are consortiums that are working on specific problems and like ProCredX and they're doing professional credentialing. That's all good. But from an industry standpoint, you know, kind of to do this, um, you know, overall, overall, overall in the industry and to make a huge difference. Um, some of them probably are kind of, you know, at this point, maybe still in the early stage, some consortium are kind of doing overlapping work because you can see the more than one consortia that are kind of working on this um, uh, drug uh, supply chain security act, like remedy and Mediledger. And, you know, there are, there are different consortium focusing on the same thing. But I think one school of thought is that, you know, at this stage, we are early, we need to welcome all ideas and then whichever the best one will win. And then at some point we will converge. I think that's, that's a good thought too. Um, but, to, but if the efforts become so fragmented, 
even though all their intention is just to help the health, healthcare space, how does it all converge and what is the overall strategy? How can companies partner together, um, not just you know providers and payers and uh, pharmacies and um, all the stakeholders across the system, um, life science research and educational institutes to partner together. I, I wonder if anybody is kind of, you know, at least making an effort in the direction or to have that kind of conversation will be really helpful. Yeah, I think that's when it just comes to a, sorry, was anyone else about to say something? Yeah, I was gonna comment on that as well, because uh, that's really interesting, Indira. I think also um, one of the things that I think about, because we're, we're talking with somebody just after this call, one around the data, holding the data um, for hospitals and so on. And I think that that's a really interesting space. After working in hospitals and knowing how they're, how um, cautious they are about adopting these technologies as well, even trying to get some of the systems that we were doing, like electronic medical records and so on in Australia, was really quite tough. So I just also, if we can get some groups talking about some of those um, barriers that they've faced in hospitals or these healthcare organisations where you're trying to get those stakeholders on board as well and, and seeing the value of this. So a real use case where you've got like, health professionals dealing with the end user in that hospital context where they're going to be recruiting those patients for clinical trials in, in those acute care settings as well. So that would be very interesting for me from a stakeholder point of view as well. Yeah, I think that's very good to have this. Uh, it'll be interesting to have that conversation with Pharma Ledger because it came out of this European um, IMI yeah. Um, what medical initiative, innovative medical initiative or something like that. Sorry if I, I forgot the, what the acronym stands for. It's, I think uh, that's one of the things that Novart is recognized that, hey, if we have to experiment and explore these blockchain options, we have to go outside the walls of our corporations in order to get, because this is a collaborative network effect. Um, we, can't, we can't benefit by ourselves. It is a network benefit, it's a network effort. So they reached out and they brought in a lot of different players and that's how this IMI was born and they've got a three to five year um, timeline. I think effort like this is really, will be groundbreaking for any industry. To will be interesting to see something like that happening in the US or maybe it's a similar initiative happening in the rest of the world. And um, maybe that's a good opportunity to kind of, you know, pull people together to have that conversation. And um, maybe, maybe in, in some ways, this, um, this group could also play that role of bringing people together mm -hmm. and kind of inviting them and say, hey, what could be done to kind of move in that direction? Um, you know, now everybody's kind of working on their own use cases and problem and a niche problem. Uh, but what does it all mean at the end of the day for the big picture? You're spot on. Yeah, I think uh, especially this group, our group in particular, could be able to to help with that. And the interoperability group, right? I mean, the interoperability group is really focusing on the technical uh, dilemmas and the ways to be able to get our systems to talk to each other. But you need to be able to have some type of, um, not evangelization, but a method to connect with others that uh, may not be as technical too. So maybe we have a, 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 we can call it a semantic interoperability, or not semantic, but maybe, I don't know, what the word would be, uh, I don't know, ideas. I don't want to, I, don't, I hate using the word evangelism because it makes me think of a religion. And though tech and things uh, and, and platforms can somewhat be political or, or religious in its similar nature, I don't like using that word. <laughs> mm. Any ideas is, 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 is fine, even if you just spit it out. Well, don't spit like within six feet of another person, but yeah. So why did you mention evangelism in, the, in what context? So like uh, we have within the, so if you look at the screen here, we have the subgroups of a payer patient subgroup, a patient subgroup, a payer subgroup, an interoperability subgroup. Uh, potentially creating another subgroup within the SIG uh, to help for, um, I know use case development is, some, is kind of similar to that, but maybe it's, um, 
it's like technical evangelism so people can understand what and how this uh, technology actually works. Does that make sense? Socializing the technology. Okay. Yeah, socializing the technology. So, okay. but you don't want to call it the socialist group <laughs> <laughs> for a number of reasons. You can't. All the, all the words in the English dictionary have been politicized so much. You just have to be careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's something to, I guess, think of uh, down the road more too. Okay. Um, this is a great conversation. I think this helps uh, for my outreach because uh, today and, and over the weekend, I'm going to be sending messages out to a lot of these folks um, that we mentioned to see if we could get presentations coming on the next coming months for them, as well as maybe even start some open source working groups to solve around specific problems. I think in a previous meeting, we did go over um, what, uh, within the SIG before about what problems industry needs to solve. And another individual who works for uh, National Institute of Health, uh, Orlando Lopez, who's a friend of myself, uh, I'm, sure Jonathan knows him and others, and Gary, you may as well. Uh, he actually created a, a human design session within his NIH AI blockchain working group that, that talked about some low-hanging fruit problems. And we did the whole like the rose thorn bud uh, scenario to understand. I, I may want to take his recording or session and send it out to the group and, and, and take from that some of the issues and problems that it was more federally focused, federally focused, sorry but it may help us with our ideation of thinking as well. Does um, Hyperledger have this, um, is it an annual conference or biannual? I don't know. It's a, there, there's an annual conference um, <clears throat> every year. It's, it's usually in person this past year it was in Phoenix. It's usually right. in March. It's the first week mm -hmm. of March. They got it away. They got away with it actually right before COVID became very mainstream in the United States. And, um, but I, I don't think there's any plan to replicate an in-person conference this year for the Hyperledger um, annual conference. Yeah. And you know, the reason why I asked is because that brings in the whole, um, hyperledger community to together, whether it's in person or virtual, um, I think kind of tapping into that network to know who are all, who are all, or is it, is it, is it, this group is out of that or, or is there another group from that community? Yeah, the, the, Can we everyone kind of in, everyone involved in healthcare is in this group. And then there's many different working groups. I mean, if, if you want to even see like, uh, hold on, give me a sec. God, I hate sharing screen sometimes. Um, if you go on to here, I mean, these are all different working groups. Um, there's, I can't scroll all the way down, but there's a climate action group, education, healthcare, public sector, social impact, uh, capital markets. There's an identity working group, architecture working group. Like, there's so many on here. Um, and uh, yeah, tons of different resources, tons of labs, labs projects you can be a part of, projects within all the, you know, the Hyperledger greenhouse of tools. Uh, Which site is this? This is wiki.hyperledger.org. Oh, okay. So, I'll put this in the chat so you can be able to find out and maybe find some other projects that interest you as well and interest everyone else. Awesome. Is there anything else we'd like to describe as a group? I have to do a lot of uh, outreach to folks and uh, but yeah, other than that, is there um, is there anything else uh, people want to be able to cover today? Well, I think if, if we line up all these people, that will keep us busy for a year, I think. Exactly. And also, I need to do a better job of, of uh, sending out and reposting and, and getting more people um, aware and interested of these meetings as well. I would ask everyone, if you could too, if I were to share something or the email is shared, please send it to anyone you believe would want to learn or understand or or um, be part of these different working groups because uh, I think just the more people we have involved, the more energy we bring, the more ideas and thoughts that uh, can make it all relevant for us. So, so yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 
All right, well, I think we can get, uh, we can finish this meeting 10 minutes early. Thank you very much. We will be meeting on October 14th, Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so uh, put that down in your calendars. There will be a schedule and, a, and an invite being sent to you soon as well. Uh, if, if there's no other questions or comments, I'll leave, I mean, right now I'll leave it to anyone to, to mention anything else. Good discussion. We kind of at least captured some thoughts on how we want to move forward. That's good. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, thank you. for that. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, thank you for the morning. Have a good rest thank of your day you. and the weekend. Have a good Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.